Alright, welcome everyone to the talk entitled Avoid Misuse of Contracts. First of all, big thank you for coming. It's Thursday, early morning. We had um, a happening. The thing that happened between me submitting this talk and the actual conference. That was a WG21 meeting, the ISO CPP meeting in Cologne, where an interesting thing happened. The contracts were already in the language, but they were taken away from us for good reasons, nonetheless. Uh, I was hoping that this talk would be way more useful, but you know what? It's still just as useful. Because the things that I'm going to be talking about have nothing to do with the specific way you would use contract checks. It doesn't matter whether it's a language-based facility or you might have your own library-based facility. The th you can still make the same mistakes. So, before I actually start talking about these mistakes, I think it would be good if we were on the same page about the terminology. I'm going to use some of it, and you probably are already aware of it, but it's good to, be all, to make sure that we are on the same page. Don't be afraid, it's a big contract. This is how we describe a contract in our, on our team, typically, uh, in, a, in a big comment. And this is a very familiar function, advance. A std advance that advances the iterator. And this contract has multiple things in it. First of all, the preconditions. The things that you have to satisfy to call the function. If you don't satisfy this, this, uh, these conditions, it's going to mean bad things for you. So let's take a look. It basically says that if you have an input iterator, if you pass a negative value to advance, the behavior is undefined. We don't know what to do with that. We don't know how to decrement an input iterator. This is a post condition. Basically, it's half of the post condition. I decided to shorten it. Basically, if n is positive, it will advance the iterator by a certain number. If it's negative, it's going to try to decrease it, unless it's an input iterator. It also has some essential behavior, which is not directly related to it. It's not a post condition. Um, it's, it's not directly related to uh, the return value or effect on any input or output or values output, uh, or the state of the program. It's something that we cannot usually express as a check. So essential behavior it's a superset. It has a post conditions and those things I, I talked about. So for example, in this case, we say that the algorithmic complexity of this algorithm is typically linear with the, non, with the n, unless it's a random access iterator. And for random access iterator, it's a one, basically. So there are two types of contracts that are very, it's a very useful term that you can use in your own development or just conversations. Uh, if a function has any preconditions whatsoever, it's said to have narrow, co narrow contract. For example, our the vector operator square brackets, where you index into a vector, has a precondition that your index is less than its size. If you, it, the preconditions don't necessarily have to be um, semantic limitations on the input parameters. They can also be semantic limitations on the state of the program or state of the object if it's a member function. So for example, a typical function that has such a uh, limitation and only such a limitation is vector front, because you only can call vector front if your vector is not empty. Otherwise, behavior is undefined. <coughs> if a function has no preconditions, it, it's said to have a wide contract. Wide contract, we have multiple examples in the standard library for it's like vector pushback. When is it in, you cannot call vector pushback? You can always call vector pushback. You can call it on a moved from vector. You can call it on an empty vector. You can call it when you don't have enough memory because it's just gonna uh, throw a bad alloc. It's all good. One, you cannot you call vector size? Same deal. You can always, always call vector size. So now that I hope we have the terminology in place, let's take a look and make a quick refresher about 
what design by contract is all about. Let's take a look at the good old square root function. You have your interface. You have, a, you have your double that you're taking in and the double that you're returning, which is presumably a square root of the number you passed in. Does this function have any semantic limitations on its inputs that are syntactically valid? It, the actual value has to be, that is passed in, has to be non-negative. So what do we do? I say if here, that is probably not the right uh, term to use, when somebody passes us a negative value. Throw an exception. Some, if we were in Java, we probably would do that. Invalid argument exception. How about returning a zero? Who thinks it's a good idea to return zero? Nobody, thank God. How about returning a NAN? NAN is better than zero. Definitely, if you decide to return normally from a square root of a negative value, returning a NAN is probably okay. Ish. Is it the best? We'll try to figure it out. How about we change the return type and inform the client not through a special value, but uh, a, a, a special type that we had an error? How about that? All right. Some takers for that as well. So, but can we do something else? Well, we just talked about it. How about we make it an error contract and say the behavior is undefined? And I'm, I would say that it's a better choice for this function. And there are several reasons why. If we make those art contracts that we have for our functions artificially wide, there are several drawbacks to that. First of all, it's, it's easy to check a value for not being non-negative, sure. But there are functions and preconditions that you cannot really check. For example, if, if you have a std sort and you have a comparator passed in, you have to make sure that that comparator satisfies strict, strict weak order or uh, imposes strict weak order on the type that you are sorting. If you have in 64s, how, th how long do you think it will take to check that all the pairs or all the triplets satisfy strict weak order? forever. Efficiency. The, the white contract or artificially white contract is typically slower. So for example, if, we, if a check is possible to check, but it breaks our algorithmic complexity, we have a lower bound algorithm. It's logarithmic in the size of the array you pass in. And its precondition is that you have to give it a sorted, a little more not just sorted, but partitioned with uh, respect to the predicate, doesn't matter. Let's say it's sorted. To check that the array is sorted is ON algorithm. So we break our algorithmic complexity. And even if we don't, we are kind of wasting effort with the, in that check uh, because we will, we will be checking something that might not be need checking. We might have uh, the data coming through a UI with a validator that makes sure that the array that is passed in um, sorted. So we'll be checking on every single call of a lower bound to that sort, that, to that lower bound algorithm. We'll be checking every single time that the array is sorted. It's a very big performance, performance hit. And we cannot ever remove those checks either because we, the contract is wide. We promise to our clients the behavior that we are giving them. Imagine trying to remove those checks. People already rely on that. And reliability <laughs> argument goes into pretty much um, a different direction. <laughs> so artificially wide contracts, for example, us returning a NAN, which is reasonable in some sense of the word, but if we return a NAN from the square root of a negative value, how long do you think it will take that NAN to be propagated to the place where it causes trouble? Especially like if it's a quiet NAN. You have a quiet NAN and just travels through your system until it gets to 
possibly the, your client and they see a NAN instead of a value, that probably you probably don't want that. It's very rare occasion where seeing a NAN on a actual person's screen is a good thing. Maintainability. We need to make sure that we're checking the, checking the preconditions and uh, possibly we are returning a status or returning a NAN. And then, we, first of all, we need to check that. We need to make sure that uh, this code is, is working. We need to test it in addition to our regular test. The clients of our function, wait, you have a return code. It's a good practice to check. So every time they call a square root, they would have to check the status. So our code is bigger and more complex. The client's code is bigger and more complex. More code runs slower. It's harder to analyze. It's not great. And finally, when we have a made a decision on whether we change the return type to make a return code, or we decided that, you know, we'll return an ad. Try, imagine putting that into production to many, many users and then deciding, hey, it was a bad idea. I want to change it back. <clears throat> I want to make it a narrow contract. That is hard. The other way around is much easier. If you have a narrow contract and you don't promise anything, then you can say, hey, well, we'll now return a NAN. Well, the clients that never violated your preconditions, they don't care. They are really, really fine. So for our square root, I would suggest it's a good idea to just leave the behavior undefined for all the reasons that I said. And quoting John Lake is, designed by contract in its essence is, if you give me valid input, I'll behave as advertised. Otherwise, all bets are off. And for a really in-depth analysis of design by contract and defensive programming, I really recommend John's talks. Uh, it's a two-part talk on CPPCOM 2013-14. So what do we do when somebody calls our function out of contract? Again, it's an if, it's a when. Let's take a look, let's take for example, a Sterlan. We decided to implement our own Sterlan. So, if somebody passes us a null pointer, what will happen? Language undefined behavior. It's a very, very scary thing. Language, if you ever try to de debug an ODR violation or any other kind of UB-based bug, you know it's hard. You know it's, it's hard to detect, it's hard to debug, and actually, it, it's so bad that it might lie dormant inside our program until we have a really important client hit an edge case and then our company revenue goes down because that guy goes away and he was a big client. Our company reputation dies. And finally, our entire business is gone. <clears throat> well, can we do something about it? Yeah, well, we can check. We can always check, right? We decided, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. This idea with the narrow contract is a horrible idea. I'm going to check every time. I'm going to be very, very sure that nobody ever violates any contract. Well, actually, you cannot do that because there are things that you cannot check, but we'll make as much as we can. And then we put checks everywhere throughout our code base and our our, actually, our program starts being really, really slow because our lower bound is ON. So our company revenue goes down because all the clients trickle out. Our company reputation is very, very damaged. And eventually, our entire business goes, well, dead, out of business. Well, I'm exaggerating, of course. But you, it, you see that it's not an easy thing. But we, we can do better. We need to observe uh, that at the point where we enter the function, but we actually haven't hit the, li the language undefined behavior, which often, more often than not comes later into the function, in the function, we hit a point where we have a library undefined behavior. And why it's undefined? Well, we said it, said it is in our contract to our function. 
that you, for a pointer for a Sterlan has to be a valid pointer uh, to a null, to null terminated string. And somebody calls us out of contract with a null pointer. So it's undefined behavior already. But it's not language undefined behavior. We are in defined state. It's all good. So we can, what we can do instead is check the preconditions. But do we always have to check? And do we have to check everything? Well, the thing is that undefined behavior is undefined. And it's up to us to check or not check, to check, to check the preconditions in some build modes and not in others. It's our decisions if we're a library developer, for example. So, in fact, we don't have to check everything because, again, it's impossible. And we don't have to check always, because in some cases, it's a wasted effort. So let's take a look. Like what, This is our Sterland. How would we check, make a defensive check? Would we make it with an if? Any, any people want to, to say it's an, just an if statement? No takers. Well, the reason why it's a bad idea is because, you know, it's an if you cannot elide it ever. It's there. So you have to wrap it up, and typically, you would wrap it up into a macro. We could have an assert, a good old C style assert, which all, only is active uh, unless a debug is defined. I was mixed up. Anyway, or you can use a more advanced uh, precondition checking or contract checking facility and say, hey, I'm gonna use BDEs uh, more complex, more refined uh, contract checking facility and call it BSLS assert. Or I really like the guideline support library and I'm going to use expects. Or I live in the world where contracts are in the language and I'm going to use a contract um, checking facility that's embedded in the language and use a precondition. What is common to all of those contract checking facilities. You can always turn them off. Because we don't have to check always. We don't have to check everything. And we can save a lot of cycles if we don't check. Of course, that, that is predicated on good testing and uh, running your program and making sure that you're not violating contracts. But you can turn them off once you are sufficiently confident that there are no contracts being violated. So, from these two um, refreshers, there are two principles for assessing whether we're making a mistake with a contract check that I want to extract. Number one, in a defect-free program, no contracts should be violated. It, saying it more simply, a violated contract is a bug in our program, always. Number two, we can always remove our contract check at any time. And it, if the program is correct, it's not gonna affect its behavior or its essential behavior. It's gonna be the same. Might be a little faster, would be nice. But essential behavior, like what this program is meant to do, doesn't change. Let's go to, our, to the first example where the, to one of those principles is violated. Misusing contract checks for control flow. And I'm not saying control flow, like terminating the program when the, when the uh, precondition is violated. I'm talking about control flow that cannot be removed. It's essential to the program. But before we get there, let's take, take a, a look and think, what does a contract check mean? So if we have a our square root, we, we see a precondition, maybe some function we've never seen before, we see a precondition. Can we think about this, this function completely ignoring this precondition? Can we analyze the code? Yes, because we can always remove that precondition without affecting the essential behavior of the program. 
So when you're analyzing your code that has assertions and, and pre and post potentially, if you have them, you can always mentally remove them and make your job easier. Or you can parse through them and first and say, oh, oh, this is what the programmer wanted to be true in this program. So it's not a hope that something like this value is going to be non-negative. It's not a hope that it's non-negative, but we can recover. No, that is not what the contract check means. And it's not a statement of absolute truth. We cannot make, make sure that when writing a library function, that nobody ever will call us out of contract, because they will. What it is, is that a statement of what should be true in a correct program, and that all the benefits come from that. This is a statement of what should be true. So you can build it, put it into your mental model and not think, that, hey, wait, 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 wait. What if that precondition actually causes some control flow changes? That is why it's very valuable to make sure that there is no control, the control flow is not affected by precondition. But let's see how the code looks that might think differently. So let's say we have my int vexer and it has an access operator with an index and we say, just return our data index. But we're smart, we're library developers. We put the preconditions in there and we check them. But come an application developer who thinks, hey, I can look inside the implementation. I can see the asserts are there. So I'm going to have my data class that will have a get value that returns a, a basically a status, a, an optional. And I'm going to put a try catch block around this access because I don't want to check myself. The checks are already there. And then I'm going to set the, the violation handler to throw an exception. So the reason why it's bad, first of all, as the assertions are actually implementation details. They are not promised. They are not described in the contract of a function as we will do this and that. They can be removed. Imagine you can no longer build this program and have it behave correctly in release mode or whatever mode which disables the contract checks. That you can no longer look at, the, at this code and see, okay, I, I'm, I'm just gonna ignore the, the assertions in my mental model because they are essential to the program. So they, it violates the second principle. Removing these contract checks will physically affect the, the essential behavior of the program probably to the point of making it language and undefined behavior. Let's take a look at different side effects in predicates, which can lead to a similar, similar problems. So let's say we have a set of integers and we say that if we fail, if we, at some point in the program, we will be inserting a value into that set of integers and it, we re, it's a bug if that value is already there. Is this a good way of checking it? Who thinks it's a good way of checking it? You guys are so smart, but that's what you get for presenting at CPPCon. It's a bad way of checking it just because if you, it has a side effect that affects the essential behavior of the program. It is actually inserts the value into the set. So if you remove that, that value will no longer be inserted. This is a better way. How about this? We have our encrypted store and we have a free function, is corrupted, that checks if the value, like an integer, is co corrupted. And we have a function that says, okay, let's corrupt the value at. And you can do it only once. So the precondition that we is that it's not corrupted yet. To me, sounds reasonable. Is it a, a good way to check it? Depends on the function. Depends on the function. That's the one. 
I'm what I was looking for. The subscript operator in a map has this wonderful behavior that it will insert a value into the map if it's not already present. So that's, we need to refine our contract and, and make sure that we are saying, okay, if the value is not in the map, we either define the behavior to be something and then not put into a contract check-in statement, in contract check, or we make it undefined, which I think it would be a better way, and then check it before we access the actual map. Not all um, side effects are born the same. Some side effects are, might be actually okay-ish, at least for a while. And it depends on your program, for sure. But let's take a look. For example, we have our header fields object that stores basically a mapping from string to string. And we have a function that checks whether, whether that map contains a specific field. And we also have an add field function. We, and we decided if somebody already inserted the value into the, into the map or our header fields object, that we're not gonna allow it again. Arguably not the best decision, but a decision nonetheless. So we put a precondition on it that our current header fields object doesn't contain a key um, with, the, with, with this particular name. So, so far nobody inserted that into the map. Do you see a side effect that will happen? Memory allocation. There's a memory allocation if that is string is long enough. What do you think, depending on the program, like say you have a normal desktop application where your memory, you don't know where you are actually executing, you don't know how much memory you have, you have virtual memory, is it okay to have such a side effect? Who thinks it's okay? All right, who thinks it's not okay? Some people think it's not okay, and I think they might be right. But so can the people who think it's okay might be right. Because that thing, you need to make sure your engineering sense is on point. You have to understand your particular environment and whether an allocation and deallocation is okay. In our environment, if you're running on desktop, I'd say it's fine. But if, you are, if you're memory limited, oh, you gotta make sure that your memory is controlled and it's the same in your production runs, memory usage, the production runs versus debug runs. Yeah? Suppose, my question is, suppose I change my build mode so that I get a slightly better optimization and I don't wind up doing the allocation as a result, having nothing to do with contracts. Is that okay? So the question is, suppose you are, um, you just change your optimization level and you uh, stop allocating something. And that has nothing to do with contracts. And I know what you're hinting at, because compilers now and nowadays can make memory allocation decisions. And that is considered okay. But again, I, it's considered okay. I'm pretty sure there are compilers that are prohibited from doing that. So again, it depends on your environment. But that's a good point. Not only the, the contract checks do that thing. Or it's, it's like increasing the optimization level when you remove the contract checks. And the same thing goes for just writing to the log. That's a side effect, obviously. But it might be okay if you put in there temporary, temporarily, even in production, it might be okay. It depends on your system, which side effects are okay. Use your engineering sense. And now we get to the biggest part, input validation. This is often when people learn about contracts, people. Uh, they think, oh, that means I can start reading from the file, just asserting that things are good, and then my pro like, but let's dig into that. Let's make sure we understand the difference. So first of all, we need to say what's an input. Well, an input is pretty much any data coming from untrusted sources. 
How do you like that definition? I think it's a bad definition in a way. You know why? Because we defined one term through another term that we haven't defined yet. So it's like, okay, an untrusted source is where we get our input. Be careful with that. <laughs> uh, well, I call it also an application envelope. I'm pretty sure I, I'm not the uh, person who came up with this term and maybe there's another term and please come by and let me know after the talk if I just said something which already has a name. So an application envelope is this collection of trusted sources and the size, its size depends on like on the application. It can, typically it's like, okay, we trust our own source code to a point. Uh, sometimes it might be okay to include some config files in the application envelope. Maybe even remote application, which, which is verified somehow to the point where we, may, we know we can trust the data coming from there. It's a very difficult thing to do, but we might save some cycles on it. I, I would say the rule of thumb is, if something is not part of your test suite, of your test process, that thing is definitely not in your application envelope. But let's move on. Let's say we have an example of an application. First, we make, we decide, hey, we want to make a rival to Google Translate or any translation application out there. So we make a throwaway proof of concept application that we will show our clients. And it so far supports only translations of words, hello, and goodbye. We will get a name of file containing that single word through command line to our application and output the translation to the standard output. So let's see how we would implement it. We could. We define an email, enum that, had, that shows us the type of greeting and we make a function called load greeting that takes a file name it opens the file name, opens the file, reads the string from it, and if it's, the string is hello, then we return the enumeration hello, otherwise we return the enumeration goodbye. And we have our main function with arguments from, from command line, from the, from the operating system. We load the greeting from the second argument, because the first argument is our uh, executable, and if the greeting is hello, we output bonjour, otherwise we output au revoir. So, let's t t look at some assertions. Is this a good assertion? Who thinks it's a good assertion? Who thinks it's a bad assertion? Yeah, it's a bad assertion. We just went through it. And basically, if you remove it, you're no longer <laughs> reading anything. Bad. How about this? I think it's, this is a bad assertion. Nobody. Yeah, it's a precondition check. It's a very reasonable precondition to expect that our program doesn't call this function within now now putter. All right. How about this one? Who thinks it's a good one? Who thinks it's a bad one? Well, it's a sanity check. If we remove that from our program, nothing will actually change. And in a correct program, it will actually not be violated. So our principles are fine. So it's okay. It's not the best. It's okay. How about these four? All of them are pretty much the same, so I didn't want to go into detail of how they are. What about these four? Good? Bad? Most people say bad. I say, in this case, it might be okay. But they stop being okay, because, you know, it's a throwaway application, it's a proof of concept. I will be the only person running that application. I'm gonna make double sure that it's the right one. I don't want to write code validation at this point of application level. I'm gonna show it, and, and I will be the one at the computer, so it's all gonna be fine. It's not gonna run in, in EB. So it's okay, but as long as we remove ourselves from our application envelope, somebody else is running the program. 
things change. Not all things change. The precondition violation check is still good. The sanity check is still okay. But these, uh, as most of you said, become horrible. Somebody else is running the application. Somebody else is applying a file which might contain no words, might be unreadable, might, might have not have the access rights. It might be might contain a word that we do not expect. If we build in debug mode, we'll crash. If we build in release mode, yeah, we'll probably crash as well, but with a sec fault instead of assertion violation. Do we want the, our people who use our program to, to have that? No. No, 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 no. This is input validation. Those people, those files, those command line arguments are outside of our application envelope. We have to check them. We have to check them regardless of which build mode we're in. And assertions are just not the tool for the job. But we did the right thing. We replaced this with input validation. And our application had tremendous success. So we, we did the right thing. Our application had absolutely, like, people loved it. People loved it so much they wanted to have it, access to it through, uh, web, web, through web. They wanted to be able to enter the word into their uh, web browser and get the translation. Is it bonjour or is it au revoir? Or is it something else? We are now better programmers. We know that we can load a whole dictionary from file and put it into a map and be able to translate more than two words. So here's our new application. We have a load dictionary function, very straightforward. And we have a main that is the core of our service. And we also, so very modern people as well, we'll package it into a container with all the data that thing needs. And we're going to run a service and people will have access to it. Maybe we'll have, we'll have a page with some JavaScript, which will access our service. All good. So let's see. Let's go through our assertions that might, we might want to put in this application and think whether it's good or not. How about this? Who thinks it's a bad assertion? Kind of hinting at it. Yes, <laughs> again. People, people in this room are very smart, so obviously that's pretty much the same example I had in the side effects one. No, let's, let's put it away for, for a moment. Precondition check, not gonna go through that again, it's okay. How about these two? Who thinks it's a good idea? Some people think it's a good idea. And I think it's fine. Why? Because it's a containerized service. We test it as a container. We package everything inside. And we set up the command line for our container. And, if, and we then test it, this whole thing. It might be considered a part of our application envelope. Again, this, is, this depends on your reliability requirements. It depends on your application. But there's nothing inherently wrong in this particular scenario uh, to, to just you know, say that this cannot happen. Because of the way that we test our application. Yeah? I, I think it also depends on who will be looking at the messages from your code. If it's a programmer, then it's OK to look at argc equals equals to. If it's, if it's a person who doesn't know what argc is, so the comment was that it also depends what if the if, if this is okay also depends on who will be looking at your um, um, error, messages. error messages, and if it's obviously if it's a normal person they will not be uh, under, will not understand what ArcC is, but this kind of, kind of brings me back to what Herb was also telling the assertion failures are, should be actually it's an error reported to the programmer, so. This also fits into, like, this is our con containerized service. So we'll be looking at our problems. We're not going to show it to the, to the people when we, after we deploy the service. And the same thing goes for these two. It's our in our application envelope. We can test it if we want to. We don't have to. We can try to still say, hey, we are people. We are fallible. Our tests are not perfect. 
and we don't want it to crash. Maybe, or especially in production, when these checks will be disabled, we might actually want to remind ourselves, hey, wait, your config file has changed. Did you test it? Oh, you tested it, but your tests are not great. But the data you fed yourself, if you want to double check yourself, then you, you might still want to um, check those with not, not with assertions, but the, it might also be okay. But I'm pretty sure nobody thinks this is a good idea. It's basically the data that the client of, of, from the web browser gave us. Something came from the vast sea of internet. No. And there is one last thing I wanted to talk about. So suppose our application became so amazing, so beautiful, so great, that we included it into our, I don't know, high-performance trading system. And we put the trading service next to our translation service in a single server room protected by a dozen of guards. And we have like complete security everywhere. Would it be okay to assert then? I see some heads shaking. Well, I think it might be okay. It's hard to say. If we literally isolate everything, if we can test, if we test both services together in that protected room, we can save cycles. And cycles are everything in Africa, high frequency trading program. I know it might be controversial, but I think it might be just okay. It's very rare, very rare. But if you test this, this whole thing together and you make sure that nobody can access the cable uh, uh, any way, either through electronic means or physical means, you can save some cycles. All right, some additional thoughts before I finish. Contract checks are not replacements for thorough testing. No matter how many contract checks you put in your program, you still have to do, have to do your unit testing, your regression testing, your integration testing. Just because you have checks doesn't mean you're going to catch all uh, you know, um, corner cases. And when the corner case comes in on the live production system, it's going to be too late. Contract checks don't actually, cannot always replace documentation. For example, say you have muted some lock. It's easy to describe what you want to happen in words, in English words. It's much more difficult to do so with the check that will actually do something. You cannot check if they, or you, you would have to spend way more resources than you wanted on checking. Checks often need access to some implementation details. That might also be a bad thing for a library. Yeah, people will still, Hiram's law will make sure, will make sure that people will still uh, depend on our implementation details, but why make it easier for them? So for example, we have uh, a registry that has a create key function and it, which increments in the private data member and then checks when data is set that the key is reasonable. And, and sometimes it's worth what, considering widening the contract. So it, in some cases, the data that is coming to us is so hard to check, and we probably will need to check it pretty much every time. Then sometimes, like building it in an AST from source code, it's a hard thing to do, and it's an easy thing to make it mistaken. Maybe, just maybe, in this case, don't use an error contract. This is actually uh, courtesy of Matt Calabresi. All right, so, no matter the contract checking facility, so, whether you use C assert, whether you use BDE, BSLS assert, whether you're using the precondition checking uh, coming to, 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 to a language at some point, or you're using GSL, no contract should be violated. And removing contracts should not affect programs, affect essential behavior. Be careful about side effects and predicates. They, may, they might bring surprising things to your life.
that you don't want to handle. And don't confuse input validation with contract checking. But you can always use your engineering sense. You can always assess whether specific side effects are OK in your system, at least temporarily. You can always think about which data you consider trusted. It's not always easy. It probably is OK to be on the safe side. So the, some of those examples are really, you have to make, be sure that, that those input files that you typically wouldn't trust, you can trust and you need to, because you know, you need the cycles, you need the ability to remove the checks. So yeah, there, there we go, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is, can you say that this new contract assert precondition check is a straight sub substitution for all C assert and is it recommended way to just use it all the time instead of old one? Uh, sorry, uh, um, is it a substitution for all, all existing yeah. contracts? Should, should I existence? use always, with, if I have the contract, should I use always this pre-assert pre instead of old c assert is yeah, a straight substitution. It's, it's always a good idea. So there are a couple things that bring advantages to the uh, from from a language uh, facility. First of all, it's uniform throughout the ecosystem, right? You can have if it's language based, people should start replacing their own facilities with precondition uh, with language based because then we will have an ecosystem that uses the same mechanism. So you don't have to remember, oh, this library uses its, its old macro, so I have to define that on the, on the uh, when I build this, and this one is using different one, so I need to make sure that they match in, our, in my release builds. I have to disable these and these, it's nice. Furthermore, unfortunately, it's still in, in works, but it's hopefully will contain the, you know, the wisdom of many people who build their own contract checking systems and it's going to be better. So yeah, I would say yes. When this comes comes to fruition, I would suggest we use that. Thanks. Hey, thank you for your talk. Um, I've got a question regarding the application envelope. Like it's really opinion based, I would say, what is in application envelope, uh, envelope and what not. For example, user can get access in some way to your file and change it. What do you do then? Undefined behavior? And what if file corrupted? What if you have a lot of microservices that are written by your company and they are like in development, uh, envelope, but they could crash because of server crash? And what do you do then? Uh, so my question is, who got to decide what's inside and what is, what, what is not? That is definitely the decision that is not very straightforward. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, you're saying that the file might be corrupted. Well, so can our executable, right? Can we not, we, can we, should we stop, start checking everything and everywhere? We cannot make sure that somebody didn't, you know, hack our executable and got into that. So it's up to the application owner pretty much what do they want to consider the part of the envelope and they have to balance it's an architect they have to balance the performance that we might get performance gain we might get from not checking in production versus the safety versus the reliability um, so it's it's a it's a difficult question and it's up to the company the programmers to decide that thank you <coughs> Question, question about the um, side effects. Is there any thoughts about guarding um, against it by, by putting some, uh, ensuring that what, we are call, what you're calling has no side effect, like const, like const expression that the compiler saves me from calling a non-const function. Like make sure this function has no side effect or this action has no side effect. Any thoughts about it? Uh, so 
here's a little story. Uh, in, in, the, in the standard, as it were before uh, Cologne, all the side effects were forbidden. It's always up to the compiler to check. And the compiler can make a much better job in, in checking. But even that cannot check everything. So it's kind of, in a way, a problem that is very, very, very difficult to solve. Furthermore, you might want some side effects to, you know, you, will, you might want to be able to print in your, uh, like in your chat. And you don't want to think about, okay, if I put a print statement here, what would happen in the uh, pre-cologne pre uh, co contracts in the language, it would be undefined behavior. That's very, very, you know, heavy handed. So yes, I mean, it's a good idea to, when you're calling a function to make sure that, hey, when you're doing a um, precondition check, for example, it's a good idea to, have to when you see uh, a call to a function that is non-const, to think, oh, am I sure I'm doing the right thing? Is it a good idea? It's, it's like it's like a uh, litmus test, right? It's like a kind of a bad smell. But forbidding or checking that there are no side effects is hard and probably counterproductive in some cases. Lisa, you were... So I did want to say one thing about um, uh, where you set your application envelope, where, what sorts of things you can assert or not. And a good way to think about it, that is to consider who's causing the condition to fail and who's taking the blame for the condition failing. And if the person who's causing the failure is the person who's taking the blame, go ahead and use an assertion. Um, if the person who's causing the failure isn't the person who's taking the blame, and especially if you are going to take the blame for somebody else causing the failure, don't use an assertion. Wow, that's an excellent thing, excellent way to put it. Thank you, Lisa. I uh, recommend everyone to go to Lisa's talks. They're, they are exceptional. There's one today at one? There's one at two. At two. One is lunch. Yeah? Um, I'm just wondering what is your thinking about the classes which, uh, let's say, are protecting themselves with locks. And the statements that you're putting in the preconditions are kind of out of their function body where you would usually take the locks and remove the locks. So things that you might have to put there might be not multi-threading safe. Like from that perspective, yeah. And wh what do you do? How do you solve this? Like, do you call only the functions which also inside take logs and make it safe? But then you have like log release log, and then another log, and preconditions could change in between. Or do you restrict to only like verifying only the things which don't require logging? Just that's that's a question about yeah. How how do you design an application that has some protected data? Uh, you protect it for multi-threading purposes. And in some cases, you want to have like a function implementation function where you don't want to uh, lock and unlock the mutex because it's additional work. Uh, but you want to say, have a precondition that the mutex is locked. Well, mutex is hard. You cannot check whether it's locked. Um, there are ways of circumventing that. For example, I remember maybe two years ago, uh, Ansel and Barbara were giving a talk about uh, basically packaging together uh, the data that you're accessing and the lock itself. So then you don't ac actually ever need to worry about it because it's a different data type. And if you, if you have access to the thing that, that you need access to, like an int, then you already, you know that you have a lock. If you don't have the add access to int, you have just a like, protected or mutex protected int, then you don't have it and you have to acquire it. So that's one way of addressing that. Maybe I had a different use case in mind. It was not about do I have the log, but more like let's say if I'm inserting something in a map and I have a wrapper function which takes a log, releases the log around, but I want to check if uh, things already exist in the map. So, okay. uh, so in that case, if I call a function which checks if it exists, it's going to be outside of the body, so outside of the log. Well, are you sure it's a good idea to check if it exists outside the log? So that, that's what I'm saying, because the precondition naturally actually is in the place which is outside of the body. Okay. Right? Just like... Additions. 
sense. Oh, I see what you're saying. Fine, like the precondition, like as it is in the pre-statement. Well, you probably have to have a wrapper. If you, if you really, really want to put it in the pre-statement, you probably will have to have a wrapper. Well, or you can, you can just go for an assert statement and, you know, gain a log and then assert and then, you know, do your work and then unlock, right? You don't necessarily have to use a pre. Uh, back to this application envelope for a, for a second. Uh, would, would you consider thinking about uh, what to include there and what not to include there? Uh, thinking about it as like an optimization step that uh, you measure and then you decide whether it's worth to, uh, to, to uh, include something into the application envelope because uh, we all know that it, those things bring a risk with them once, once we include it there. Yeah, absolutely. Like before you do any kind of optimization, like any kind, and yes, you probably can look at this as some kind of optimization because you, you put in the assertion and you're saying, okay, I want to not check that, but it also makes you it makes your reasoning a little easier. But yeah, measure. Like thinking of what to put in the envelope. It's it's absolutely a difficult decision, which everyone has to make for themselves. But things that you know that are coming from the outside, never ever ever use an assert on that. I want to thank you for this talk. It was very enjoyable. And one of the things I like about this talk, unlike many of the other talks where people are explaining syntax and how to do something, and here's a tool, go off and have a good time. This is an incredibly subtle engineering topic. There are a lot of people in the room that have thought about it all their lives. And I've got news for you. Not everybody in the room who is part and parcel to this was exactly in agreement until the slides were explained. I've got news for you, this is awesome. So if you were a little bit, I'm not sure about that, it's a little tricky. There's a reason for that. We're right on the edge of making an engineering decision. And it can go either way. You might think one way, your manager might think another way, and his manager might think another way because that person's responsible for the health of the company. And all of those decisions are different. So when you ask who's gonna make the decision, a lot of people have to make the decision. You have to talk about it. I really wanna thank you for presenting something that's just so awesome. <laughs> I can't even tell you. I'm, you. I'm so proud of you. Yeah, awesome. All right. Seems like there are no more questions. Thank you.